What's up, guys? Chris here, and I want to talk about some comics this week. Uh, it's going to be rum and review, style review, except I don't have any rum because it's 1 o'clock. And I generally don't drink before 1.15, so I'll probably get one after this because uh, I'll be so stressed after making the video. Because I got friends in all places where the whiskey drowns and the beer chases my blue. I'm a little bit tired and I need to shave. There's a lot I should be doing. My whole family's napping though and comics were really great this week so I wanted to talk a little bit about what I read. I did pick up two $5 books which this is the new thing that they're doing. So Marvel I guess with their number ones are going to do five $5 books that are 30 pages or whatever uh, and I got a one shot. So one, mine was a one shot and then an annual here. So uh, this is the first one. It was the Death of Wolverine with Deadpool and Captain America. So if you guys have been reading the Deadpool series, there was a story called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And it took uh, Wolverine, Deadpool, and Captain America to North Korea on a bit of an adventure together looking for his wife and daughter, or his uh, ex-lover and daughter, the mother of, his, of Deadpool's child. And that was a really, really awesome storyline and my favorite in that series. So... That's why I wanted to pick this one up, and I really enjoyed it. Um, they have an interesting relationship because they're very three very different personality types, but they they all come from a similar background in that they were all sort of experimented on it with the super super soldier serum, uh, with Project X and all that. And you have uh, Captain America, who was the successful one, who everything worked out really well. You have Deadpool, who was the one they totally messed it up. They screwed him up uh, mentally and physically. And you have Wolverine, who it's sort of the guy in between where it sort of worked, but he's still feral and animalistic, and they couldn't really control him. So their relationship has been really good, and they've all gone through similar things as superheroes, um, some of them losing loved ones, others um, sort of sets setting on the side of good where Deadpool is kind of more on the side of evil and Wolverine was somewhere in the middle so their relationship is really interesting and really cool so uh the the point of this book I guess is they're getting rid of all of Logan's things and trying to remove all like levels of DNA in the world because they don't want him being cloned or brought back or whatever and they think and Captain America who's sort of this old school guy is sort of old-fashioned and thinks you know, it's just not natural to bring these heroes back. Um, it's funny that it's literally like a month later and they're already talking about how to bring him back because they do end up with some DNA and there's a decision whether or not uh, Deadpool's going to get rid of it or not. And he has to sort of make this moral decision. And I'll let you read it to find out what happens. But uh, it's interesting that they're going into it already, that they couldn't even wait one month to let it sit. And I get it, it's because they like this death of Wolverine event they just want to cash in on. And fair enough, like I think this book could have come out six months later and been a little more interesting, maybe or three months later. But um, they want to cash in on the hype right now as it's been pretty successful, I guess. So I, I don't really blame them as a company. But uh, this is uh, Jerry Dugan who writes this, who does do a lot of the Deadpool writing. So the thing with Deadpool is, and Spider-Man and these sort of funnier characters is... It's hard to do them well because some people just aren't that funny. Like I myself, I try to be funny a lot, but most of the time it falls flat. And it's it's difficult to be consistently funny. So we all love characters when they're witty and funny and uh, are making jokes and making you laugh as you go. But it's hard to do that, and all writers can't do that. So I think Dugan does a really good job at writing Deadpool and making him funny, uh, as well as balancing out some more serious elements, which is exactly what this is about. So... There's a couple of nice flashback moments in this issue with each of the heroes and Wolverine and sort of what their relationship was and some nice action and fighting and all that. Is it worth $5.99? So um, it is a 30-page book, so I guess it sort of depends what you think. But what I find in this, this issue is they do have a lot of larger panels. Like, they still have a lot of, like, four-panel pages. So, like... I'm wondering, like, you have extra pages, okay, that's nice, but is there actually more content because you don't have that many panels per page? It sort of, it gets interesting to think, like, is there more work going in? Or are you actually getting more of a story because of this? Is there extra scenes in there that wouldn't have been in there on, like, a 
a three ninety nine book or a two ninety nine book. I think honestly, I think they're just pushing the limits to see you know how far will people go there. Marvel, I know, like any company wants to make money, and you can't blame them for wanting to make money. Um, but I think as a reader and at you are a customer, like I know we're all fans and we all enjoy reading them. I just want to encourage people not to be fanboys, okay? Be a fan, not a fanboy. Because if you start letting this company just put out slot constantly and you'll just buy anything that they make because it's got Spider-Man on it, it's got Deadpool, it's got Harley Quinn, whoever, then you're just being a fanboy and you're you're really hurting the characters because you don't encourage them to put out a good product. You're encouraging them to put out shit because you'll just buy it because it has that picture on it. So I just want to encourage people not to be branded uh, to be bought to buy in so much to their brand that they feel they they owe it to the character somehow or the the company to support that character even though they're putting out crap. Um, but I thought this was a really good story. So for me, I guess it was worth the five dollars I paid it, and we'll see what happens in the future with these five dollar books. One thing that is nice with the five dollar price tag, I guess, is it'll make people hopefully think more about buying number ones and and not just buy them up because they're think they might go up in value or whatever and they're just using them as investments which is a pain because you might go in and actually want to buy a book and they're all gone because some guy bought them out that said i think it makes more sense to have a number one cheaper have it like a dollar an issue because it might encourage you to try a book out that you wouldn't be interested in in the first place uh, but if it's five dollars i'm not going to read a storm number one that's five dollars because i just don't care but if it was a dollar i might pick it up and they might suck me in so just some things to think about i guess with price tagging would love for you guys to comment let me know what you think about the pricing just going to sneak in here real quick guys i forgot to add this to the video and i'm going to put this in this random spot uh, i also picked up this week the flash number 35 the monster variant cover which is uh, Ryan Otley cover. He does Invincible and just awesome. If you can see, there's all the little people down here and Flash is just busted through and grabbed all their brains in an instant and is munching away. So I really love this cover. I thought it was awesome. This is actually, I think, the first Flash book I've ever bought. Um, and I'm a big fan of Ryan Otley. He's really good at discussing violence, so it's really perfect. These monster covers, I don't think have been that great. I bought a couple of them just from the books I was getting anyways. Like I got it for Batman and Batman and Robin. Um, but this one I actually really, really wanted and sought out. So I actually asked my guy to put it in my bin and he forgot. Luckily they had one left and I was able to grab it right before because I think this one is just killer. I, I, I'm really happy I got it. So just want to show that off too. Okay, keep watching the video. It continues to be good. Batman Eternal number 30. Holy cow, this book's getting crazy. I guess it's always been kind of crazy. Uh, but some stories I feel sort of drag on a little bit and stuff. But I've really been interested in what's happening with Batwing in uh, Arkham. And they've had a four-issue break or something from that. So finally get to find out what's going on with him. Finally get to see the Spectre show up. I'm going to show you the picture because it's awesome. I just ordered a whole bunch of early uh, um, DC, what are they called, adventure comics, and with the, featuring the Spectre. So I'm really excited because, like in this, he's like badass in those comics. He's just straight up murdering people in like horrific ways. So in this, you see just how badass and powerful he is as he shows up and just does what he needs to do. Uh, one of the issues people have with the Spectre is he's just way too powerful, like a lot of. Uh, uh, DC characters I guess but when you have a story like this that's using a whole bunch of characters and they they did a good job at you're waiting and waiting for him to come out of Kerrigan and Kerrigan can't control when he comes out he just comes out when he chooses um, and then he shows up just in time and shuts everything down it sort of limits his power then that when you have know you have this power source inside a character that kind of comes out when it it wants to but not necessarily when it's convenient so um yeah, really well done in this. My biggest issue with Batman Eternal is I felt like for a lot of these, it didn't need to be 52 issues. I feel like they could have tightened it up just a bit and probably could have done the story in like 40 issues. I wish they would have set up uh, the axe a little bit different in how it's going. Um, it just, th there seems to be a little bit of a drag on and it's all setting up to this fiery Gotham scene we've seen. 
And I hope that's not going to be issue 52. I hope that's coming soon, and then we'll see stuff after that. Um, because I, I could see them dragging it on for another 52 issues before finally Batman is beat. And then next year, we'll see what happens afterwards. So that would annoy me. Um, if you're reading Batman right now, a lot of people are complaining because Batman was the zero year, and now it's going to the future. Um, it just doesn't want to be in the present. I think this is the story. This is the reason why that's happening because you have Detective Comics, you have these other books, and you have Batman Eternal. That's sort of the modern time story. Uh, so it's hard to have this a Batman story that Scott Snyder's writing in tandem with this because this is such a big event in in the Batman Eternal universe. I guess you'd say. So um, I, I'm still enjoying Batman. I'm okay with it because I'm reading Batman Eternal. Uh, but yeah, really awesome work. Mega event happens in this. You guys might already know about it. it ties into that new series, Arkham Manor, which I didn't pick up because I just have too many Bat books already. Um, but really awesome. And awesome to see Batwing doing his thing. I love because he's so into um, technology and science that he has such a challenge with this magical side of things and he just can't wrap his head around it. And we see a really cool thing where he's trapped and he's stuck in the dark and he begins to recite the Lord's Prayer, kind of giving up that side of him uh, to a side of faith as as his technology has failed him. And he's been through this huge, huge event where uh, everything he knows as fact has sort of been challenged. So really awesome writing here on, on that side of the story, I think. And continue to enjoy this. Hey guys, I just remembered I didn't actually mention the inside of the book, which I did read. And I didn't really care for it that much. It was okay. It was kind of confusing, obviously, because I'm it's a DC book and that's what they do. Uh, but it was all right. There was some cool the art and stuff, and it was really cool. Lots of electricity and explosions and confusing things about who's who and uh, Wally and Barry and different other guys who can run really fast, punching each other. So it was good. Uh, I think if you maybe are a Flash fan, have been reading it, might be a good place to jump on because it seemed like the start of some sort of Flashy type story. So check it out if you like Flash. If not, then maybe don't. Saga is back, number 24. Um, we get to see, this is, uh, I forget the character's name, but it's the Will's sister. And where the Will has the lion cat, she has a dog who shoots uh, poison darts out of his mouth and stuff. So more strange characters and stuff. Um, I want to show an awesome picture in here. Fiona Staples is just, she's high on my artist list now. And she just, I never realized that such twisted things could be so entertaining. <laughs> and just what she does with color and everything is just amazing. But like the sex scene with the giant spider, like that's terrifying. But it's just awesome. Like I would love to see her face when Brian K. Vaughn is like presenting these ideas to her that he's going to want her to draw. But uh, Saga picks up. Quite well, we see what's been happening with uh, the black girlfriend, Mar Marco's ex-girlfriend, and the little girl. I forget her name. I'm butchering this. I should really know the characters' names. <laughs> One thing with Saga is whenever you see an adorable creature, get nervous because they love to create these adorable creatures and then brutally murder them. Uh, it breaks my heart, and I see them, and I get nervous. As soon as I see that face, I'm like, oh, this guy's going to get freaking wasted. Like that... Earlier issue, there was like an adorable mouse that got gassed. Mouse medic it was terrible. But this, the, the cliffhanger at the end of this is really great. It really feels like it's projecting this new story arc in a great direction. And I'm excited to see where it goes. As kind of what's happening is Marco's child and Prince Robot the Fourth's child is kidnapped by that crazy robot janitor. He's kind of a, a religious, not religious, he's a, a, just a fanatic uh, who's sort of obviously quite messed in the head in the monitor and is is trying to seek revenge by taking power from those who are powerful as he's been sort of uh a lowly servant his whole life so uh brian k vaughn just always able to bring strange uh, beautiful creatures and worlds into a real world scenario and real issues and struggling with real themes like family and war and famine and power and all these interesting interesting topics he just does so well in in this universe i love this series all right rick remender's black science number 10 continues to do well we're exploring the kids a lot more they seem to be becoming really the main characters of this story as 
uh, their father has been killed. The interesting thing is if anyone dies, they can always come back because there can be a person from a different universe that will then take over as the, as the father from that. I'm really starting to get confused, though. Um, I don't know if you guys are feeling the same, but as they're bringing in certain characters and different things, which I remember who's who, um, sometimes you see, like in this one, I believe there was two versions of the dad from different universes who are facing off in a completely different world than we're seeing the main character group is all in. So I'm just trying to keep everything sort of figured out. It would be nice if they had some little subtitles there letting you know like the name of each universe or something, some way of sort of helping keep track of everything because it's a really confusing concept. It's awesome and it's really fascinating and you get to see some beautiful imagery and amazing places and creatures and things like that. It's all the stuff I love. Um, and Matteo Scalera is just really, really great at drawing action scenes and adventure and there's so much of this. It's always fast moving and high paced. So that's been great, but I'd like to have a little more about uh, explaining the story and what's happening almost every issue because when a month break happens it's really hard to keep track of all this stuff it might just read better in trade if you guys are interested in this probably better pick up and trade all right and my last 499 book was swamp thing annual number three which is we find out sort of uh, what is going to happen with how do you pronounce the name capucine I think capucine um, that sort of night immortal knight who's been hanging out with uh, Swamp Thing for a while. I, I didn't wasn't reading Swamp Thing when her origin started, so I don't even know how he met her or whatever, but she's kind of been assisting him and hanging out, uh, giving him certain knowledge on ancient people and creatures and things like that, as well as fighting alongside of him. And they've sort of sparked up this friendship. And we find out that she is dying. Her thousand years are coming up, and we get a sweet cameo, or not cameo, sweet appearance of... This guy here, the demon. So I haven't ever read a demon story, so it's really neat hearing that. Um, it kind of, you figure out sort of where the story's going because, like, I assumed he was more of a hero than a villain. And in this, they sort of build him up like the villain. So you you get an idea what's going to happen. But really neat, uh, the way Soul writes him is he's known as, like, the rhymer. So he, he creates limericks and is rhyming the whole time. There's one point, like, he does a big limerick where he's talking about the uh, capuchin's past and he does it all in the school limerick and then he breaks that and he just explains it in plain english because he assumes that swamp thing couldn't figure it out and i felt like that was just put in there to pander which was disappointing because i did, the way the images were done and and the limerick you could understand exactly what he was saying i don't think it needed that plain language and it, i would have liked to see just the whole book him speaking in rhyme um it, it sort of took away from him but Really interesting uh, character there. He's this ancient demon who's combined with a knight. And and he had made a deal for her body when the time runs up. Yeah, I, I enjoyed this story. It was nice to see what was going to happen with her. Uh, she seems like she's moving on from the story for now, but we will see in the future, I guess. Uh, I think worth the read. Worth the five ninety nine. Great story. Some good fighting. Interesting characters. There was It was funny. There, when I first opened this, I was not impressed with the artist because... If you go right way back to the beginning of this Swamp Thing in the New 52, the art is just spectacular. Like, I don't know a better artist from those early books. There's just these beautiful, beautiful scenes. And then you get this where, like, uh, like if you can see on that, she just says, like, a blank face. And it just, it's, when you're used to it being so top-notch and then you're kind of coming down to that, it's disappointing. But there actually are two artists in this. So as the book goes on, the art does get better and different scenes are done a lot better um they do like they do another one of these which i always love when they do these big page spreads with the psychedelic sort of look i don't want to show too much because it might be a spoiler that's some of my favorite things they do in the swamp thing i love that trend and soul is doing a great job so far i'm, I'm really swamp thing is really growing on me i don't like him as much as the scott snyder run but i have really enjoyed uh Swamp Thing, and I never thought I'd be such a big Swamp Thing fan, but this is one of the books I look really look forward to every month. Uh, my 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 pull list has shortened lately, but it's still pretty big. But I I, only, I have a few books that I really seriously enjoy, so I kind of use those are generally my the bar I set. So if the books aren't living up to that, then eventually I'm just going to drop it because after five or six issues where I think it's okay, but not great, I'm just not interested. I have really high standards these days. So Swamp Thing is one of the ones, um, Invincible, Daredevil, 
um, East of West, Black Science. These books I, I always look forward to, and they just stay on the list. So um, another really good job. I think worth the $5 for that, and it's a nice long story. Check it out. All right, guys, that's it. I had a great week with comics today, so I wanted to share some of that with you. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you later.